This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm here to read you a bedtime story. The time has come, my friend, for the much-anticipated part two of Andrew Parker's Obscene series. I was pleasantly surprised at how well the first part was received, and if you think my buddy Andy was imaginative with the gore then, well, just wait. Oh, and let me give a proper introduction. Andrew Parker is a totally normal, creative human who doesn't know anything about the network of interconnecting tunnels that may or may not exist below our national parks. He is just a squeaky clean, normal guy with a boring, non-violent past that nobody should look too closely into. Without further ado, here is part two of... Obscene. With the hospital behind me, as well as the hurt core business, I was free to start my life over with a clean slate. I checked online to see if there had been any news reports about the murders in the old abandoned building and I couldn't find anything. Absolutely nothing. It was really weird. At this point, months later, someone should have stumbled onto the scene by accident. And it wasn't like some story that would get buried on the back page of the local paper. It was pretty fucking notable. One man in a gimp mask with a face full of nails and a malleted head, like he'd met the titular character of that one Beatles song, Maxwell's Silver Hammer and another with his head smashed to bits like a real-life Humpty Dumpty. It was really fucking strange. But I suppose the silver lining was the total lack of consequences or punishment for myself. If I hadn't been connected to them by now, I probably never would. And the only person presumably still alive who was involved, the muscle bitch who started the video off, surely wouldn't be coming forward since doing so would implicate her as well. But all this was beside the point anyway. It was a pretty clear-cut case of self-defense. I don't think any jury would convict me. Since I'd been evicted from my apartment while I was in a coma, I called on my friend Ashton for a place to stay. Ashton had made a lot of Bitcoin early on, moderating the dark market Silk Road and Alpha Bay, before they'd been taken down lucrative work, but too dangerous now. After Ross Ulbricht, the creator of Silk Road, had been busted, the feds had a real hard-on for the dark web black markets. Due to his time navigating these waters, he knew a lot about hacking, internet security, and cryptocurrency, so there was plenty of less risky ways for him to apply his skills and knowledge. He lived pretty modestly for a Bitcoin millionaire, much like Ebenezer Scrooge, living frugally while sitting on a huge, constantly growing trove of money. He said someday he planned to retire with his Bitcoin millions and go live out the rest of his days on some tropical beach, sipping pina coladas out of a hollowed-out coconut with one of those tiny little umbrellas and taking in the island breeze. He had an extra room at his house and said I could crash indefinitely. Ashton was a good friend. He even came and picked me up from the hospital when I was finally discharged. Hey, brother. Thanks for letting me crash here for a while. Till I get back on my feet. I said to Ashton in the kitchen of his house, setting the plastic hospital bag that contained all my earthly belongings on the kitchen counter. Anything I can do to help, man. He said, 
looking at the bag. Let me know if you need to borrow any cash for clothes or whatever you need to get started. Thanks so much, dude. I really appreciate it. You looking rough, bro, he said, reaching into the fridge and coming out with two beers. He popped the tops and handed me one. You gonna tell me what the fuck happened? (laughs) I've seen you beat the shit before, but that's a new one for me, he said, pointing to my newly deformed hand. I'll get around to it. Still a lot right now to revisit, I said, slugging back about half the beer. Yeah, yeah, I get it, he said sympathetically. He knew sooner or later I'd probably spill the tea on how I ended up in a four-month coma with a skinned hand. A few beers later, and I pulled out the thumb drive I'd lifted from the body of the director. What you got there? He asked, inquisitively. I'm not sure exactly. I was hoping you could tell me. Where'd you get it? He asked, somewhat suspiciously. Better if you don't know. Probably gonna be sensitive info. Hoping there's some crypto on it. 30% finder's fee if there is. Normally I charge 10, but... You got me a little nervous about this one. You show up out of nowhere in worse shape than I've ever seen you? With a mysterious hard drive? Ugh, sketches me out. Fair enough, I said. Considering it'd be worthless to me otherwise... This was a pretty fair deal. Ashton sat down at his desk, grabbed a pack of camel cigarettes from the corner of his desk, lit one, and plugged the little thumb drive into the front of his computer tower and typed away on his keyboard. Huh, 128 AES encryption. There's definitely something on here, he said, interested and clacking away on his keyboard. This is looking to be a pretty intensive job, but nothing I can't handle. Might take me a few hours to crack it. Feel free to crash out if you want. I'm sure you're ready to sleep on a real mattress after so long in a hospital bed. I was ready for a real bed. Between the beers and the chaos of being discharged, I was exhausted. I flopped down onto the big, soft mattress and drifted off into sleep almost immediately. I dreamt of crumbling concrete and dripping, rusted pipes, dank, dirty corners, and the smell of blood and burnt flesh. I saw exposed organs, wet and dripping with gore, and sharp, cold steel gliding through muscle and sinew. I woke violently drenched in sweat. Ashton had his hand on my shoulder, shaking me, and he seemed distressed. What did you just get me involved in? Where did you get that drive? Huh? I muttered, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. That thumb drive, where the fuck did you get it? I've seen some intense shit, but the stuff on that, that's like, next level. That's... That's like some Peter Scully No Limits fun shit. Who? I would understand soon. I knew it. If you don't know, you don't want to know. I was pressing on my temples. The dull headache was now growing into a harsh pounding behind my eyes. You got any ibuprofen? He laughed cynically. Ibuprofen? Seriously? What the hell happened to you? You get scared straight or something? He said, leading me back to his office. Yeah, or something. I got to my feet and shambled along behind him. There's a wallet key on here too. Looks like you lucked out. He said, sitting down in his high-backed gaming chair. How much we talking? Not sure yet got a little distracted with the other contents there. Plus, I figured I'd wait for you to crack it open. Make sure you know I'm not trying to rip you off. Cool. Let's see what we got. 
I said. Ashton nodded, lit a cigarette, and began inputting the 64 character key. All right, let's see what we got here, he said, punching the enter button theatrically. After a beat, the page on the monitor changed. Ashton's eyes went wide, and the lit cigarette fell from his mouth onto the desk. 35 Bitcoin and some change, he said, disbelieving. What's, what's a Bitcoin worth now? I asked. Dude, that's like $800,000. I was gobsmacked. We both sat there with our mouths hanging open. Who did you get this from? He asked, retrieving the smoking camel. To be honest, I don't even really know. I explained. I only met the guy once. But I wouldn't worry about it. The guy I took that off of won't be making any new features anytime soon. Good. Same guy responsible for that mangled claw? He inquired, pointing at my maimed hand. Yeah. I paid him back, though. He raised his eyebrows with a look that said he believed me. I'll bet. I doubt he parted with this willingly. Are you sure he's not going to send some goons after you? That's a lot of money, and there's some serious incriminating shit on here. I wouldn't worry about it. Everyone involved is dead, I said. Is that supposed to make me feel better? He asked, incredulously. I shrugged. I told you. Don't worry about the details. Listen, it's hard for me not to worry after seeing the state you're in and the shit on the drive. Let's just get these coins moved and I can try to start to forget about it. Cool beans. No one can track that once you moved it, right? It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Transactions are stored on the blockchain. I gave him a blank stare. This was gibberish to me. The blockchain is essentially a public database. Kind of like a digital ledger of transactions, among other things distributed across all the computers that make up the network. Uh Uh-huh. Someone who knows what they're doing could plausibly track a transaction from wallet to wallet and from wallet to bank, assuming they have access to the records of whatever exchange service was used to sell the crypto. Okay, that makes sense. This was still pretty over my head, but I was getting the gist of it. So, to add a separate layer of security, I'll send it through a tumbling service. He continued. You send it to a tumbler that'll break apart your money into a bunch of little transactions, mixes them up a bunch with a bunch of other people's crypto, and then sends you your money in a nice, fresh Bitcoin wallet. People have a much harder time tracking coins that go through a tumbling service, They'll take a small percentage as a fee, but with this kind of money... Perfect, I said, clapping Ashton on the back. See? This is why you get paid the big bucks. Why are you tripping? It's... It's just... The video's on that drive, man. He looked vacantly, off at nothing, and lit another cigarette. Whatever he saw in there had really rattled him. Like, like who makes that type of shit? Who even thinks of it? And who's paying that much for it? I want absolutely nothing to do with this man. It's like I said, the guy I got it from is dead. There's no need to sweat it. Ashton stubbed out his cigarette in the ashtray next to his keyboard. All right, I'll transfer this crypto through a tumbler. He said, typing rapidly. In an hour or two, when the tumbling is done, the coins will be in your new wallet, which I've already set up. 
great, I said. Ashton opened up a new window, and his fingers deftly flew across the keyboard in a blur. When he finished whatever he was doing, he spun the chair around to face me and held a second small thumb drive in his hand. Here you go. This is your key. It gives you access to your wallet. Do not fucking lose this. There's a ton of stories of would-be billionaires who lost their key due to carelessness. He handed off the first drive as well, with the cord attached. You won't need this one anymore. I recommend burning this shit, and all the fucked up videos on it. I looped the new drive onto the leather cord with the first one, and hung it around my neck. How do I... sell it? How does this translate to money I can actually spend? Jesus Christ, man! It's 2022! Get with the times! I threw my hands up at him to show my ignorance. He continued after rolling his eyes. There's plenty of exchange sites, but considering the source here, I'd recommend something a little more private. There's a website called Local Bitcoins. You go on there and set up something with someone to send you cash or a bank transfer, and then you send them the corresponding amount of coin. I recommend cash for obvious reasons. <laughs> you don't want the IRS or anyone else to be able to track you. And in that vein... He rolled his office chair across the room, opened up a cabinet, and pulled out a tiny black phone encased in big plastic bubble packaging. The kind you see behind the counter in gas stations. Use this. It's a burner phone. Never hurts to be careful. You're paranoid, dude. I said, raising an eyebrow. It's not paranoia if they're really out to get ya. He said, pointing to his head in a sort of big thoughts gesture. After a bit of navigating on the website Ashton gave me, I found someone relatively close by. I called the buyer and set up a meet. 5000 in cash for a tenth of a coin to be placed in a neutral escrow account until payment. It was a bit below market value, but I was paying for convenience here and privacy. We agreed to meet up at a local supermarket lounge. The kind where you can sit and eat the sandwich they make you at the deli. Nice and public. All right, I've got a meet set up. Can I borrow your car? I asked Ashton. Yeah, keys are hanging by the door. Mi casa es su casa, amigo. Thanks. Y you got a... You know... Gun? Yeah, I got you. He said, opening a drawer on his desk and reaching in. Here, take this. He tossed me a black and orange handgun. A Glock-style model with a shiny finish. It felt like a toy. You're kidding, right? I asked, shaking the gun. Nah, that's legit. 3D printed it myself. The slide and barrel are metal, but everything else is a PLA thermoplastic monomer. <laughs> it's so light, I said, surprised, inspecting the plastic firearm. <laughs> you can just squirt this out on a 3D printer, huh? Yep. That's the future right there. Don't get caught with it, though. Ghost guns are pretty fucking illegal, and they'll want to know where you got it. No kidding. Fingers crossed there's no shootouts for me today, I said, racking the slide to check the chamber. There's a bullet already in there, ready to fire. Jesus, man. You keep this thing ready to rock? No point in keeping a gun for protection if you ain't ready to protect yourself. Bad guy isn't going to wait for you to cock your gun. Good point, I said, tucking the piece into the front of my pants and turning to leave. And be careful not to blow your dick and balls off when you sit down, he called after me. Yeah, I'll try not to, I said, walking out the front door. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery 
takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factors 2-Minute Meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factors no prep, no mess meals, free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scareyoutosleep50 at factormeals.com. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. I met with the buyer at the supermarket, and I was shocked when it was a young woman. Not sure exactly what I expected. Maybe a suit-clad businessman or some unwashed incel neckbeard. She didn't look at all like someone who would know anything about cryptocurrency or the deep net, much less be involved in it. She just looked like some well-to-do suburban housewife. Even still, it was pretty nerve-wracking. For all I knew, she had some goon outside waiting to ambush me on the way back to my car to steal her money back. I think she probably felt the same way about me. At first, she just sat there silently, eyeing me suspiciously and keeping one hand constantly in her purse. I don't know if she had a gun as well, or just wanted to give me that impression. I broke the ice by introducing myself, and we got talking a bit. Apparently this was her business. 
trading Bitcoin for cash at below market value from less than legitimate sources and then turning around and selling it for full price on legitimate exchange sites. She didn't ask me mine. The less she knew, the better. And she understood that. Plausible deniability. We made our exchange and set up a date to meet again for the rest. She had the funds, but would need a few days to collect them all in cash. I'd be taking a pretty serious loss on it, but I wanted to get it done and get started living my new life. Now that I had some walking around money, I had some shopping to take care of. I stopped by a Walmart. I took my time shopping, perusing each aisle in the store, daydreaming about how I was going to spend my newfound wealth. With this kind of money, I could really do whatever I wanted. Maybe I'd open a dive bar in one of the Florida Keys, or maybe I could open an auto shop and restore vintage muscle cars. I didn't know anything about auto mechanics or how an engine even really worked. Shit, I could barely change a tire, but it sounded romantic, and I could learn. About an hour after dreamily ambling around the store, planning my future life, I made my way to the checkout. Pants, shirts, shoes, socks, underwear, some frozen pizzas, and beer. Nothing but the essentials. On the way home, I sang along with the radio. I was really starting to feel like myself again. Years of violent beatings and drug use had put me in a kind of malaise that I hadn't really even understood the full scope of until now. I pulled into the driveway and got out, grabbing the bags of my new clothes in one hand and the case of beer in the other. I began to get a prickly, disconcerting feeling all over my body. The sun had set and the house was weirdly dark. No lights in the windows, no porch light on. As I got closer, I could see that the front door was open, wide open, and there were splinters of wood from the frame on the floor. My heart began to pound out of my chest. Ashton? I shouted into the house, hoping against hope he'd respond. There was only silence. My focus became razor sharp, and I think every hair on my body was standing on end. My vision tunneled and my muscles tensed. I felt like Spider-Man in the comics when his spider sense was going off. I could practically see the wavy little lines coming off of me. Something was very wrong here. I dropped my grocery bags and beer, drew the pistol from my waistband, and cautiously I stepped into the open doorway, holding the gun out in front of me, gripped in both hands like in the movies. I crept from room to room, careful to check the corners and closets as I made my way through the house. Eventually, I entered Ashton's office. The computer was on, and a video was playing. I could see it was a live stream with a chat window in the bottom right, like YouTube but much more bare bones, like an old Angel Fire page. Lower quality to make for faster stream through the Tor Dark Web Network. The video frame featured a half-naked, hooded man, quietly sobbing, seated on, or rather, strapped into, a kind of modified stationary bike with a reclined chair attached. His wrists were duct-taped to the handles, and a tube led from one arm to an IV bag that was hanging adjacent. His feet were strapped into the pedals and then run through with long screws, fixing his feet there. Red rooms are urban legends, live streams hosted on the dark net where depraved basement dwellers can pay exorbitant amounts of money to view terrible acts like rape, torture, and murder live. You always hear about them from somebody who met someone whose brother knows someone who saw one once. Entirely elusive. Most people who've heard of them don't think they actually exist. And I was one of them. But here I was, 
with one unfolding right in front of my eyes. As I watched, transfixed, a masked man dressed in surgeon scrubs entered the frame. Ah, our guest of honor is here, he said, and walked over to the slumped figure and ripped off the hood. In abject horror, I realized it was Ashton. Ashton screamed. The doctor slapped him and inserted a rubber bridle, like one used for a horse, between Ashton's teeth. Then, a kind of helmet was set upon his shaved head, with wires leading out of it, like the crown they'd placed on the heads of prisoners being executed in the electric chair. Sweat ran down his back, and his eyes were wild with fright. The obscene doctor walked off camera for a moment and returned, gripping a scalpel. He reached forward with the scalpel. Ashton wailed a muffled. An incision was made at his belly button to a few inches above it. As he begged around the bridle and struggled against his restraints. The foul surgeon reached into the fresh wound with a gloved thumb and forefinger, felt around for a second, and withdrew a coil of intestine, which he then severed. He pulled a few feet of it out, and it was fed through a hanging pulley about a foot or two in front of my screaming friend's stomach, and then hooked it down into the gears of the stationary bicycle. Tears streamed down the sufferer's face. The doctor made his way to the background of the video, where against the wall was mounted an old electrical toggle, like the kind you'd expect to see in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. The tormentor's hand hovered, over the toggle. Pedal. He demanded, like a demented spin class instructor. Ashton refused, and the toggle was thrown. His whole body tensed for a moment, locked in spasm. The doctor released the toggle, and the victim slouched back, gasping for air. One hundred volts, ladies and gentlemen. Any more, and his flesh would begin to cook. The tormentor delightedly stated, Now, pedal. Ashton began to sob. Pedal, now. He began to pump the pedals jerkily. With every rotation, the dripping, wet, pink rope drew out of the slit in his belly through the pulley and coiled into the gears of the bicycle. I couldn't take it. I couldn't look at it anymore. My eyes drifted away from the window and to the top of the monitor where the webcam sat. The little red LED light on it was on, indicating it was in use. A horrible thought occurred to me. They were watching me. I was the guest of honor. The torturer had waited for me to start killing my friend. For me to watch. My head spun and I tasted sour vomit in the back of my throat. I reached under the desk and ripped the power cable from the back of the computer and the screen went black. In that moment, I saw a dark silhouette looming over my shoulder in the monitor's reflection. And it felt like my heart stopped. I whipped around to face the intruder, snatching up the pistol on the desk. There stood a figure, a ski mask covering their face, and a blood-streaked hunting knife in a gloved hand, poised to stab. I was already on high alert, in fight-or-flight mode, but this kicked that into a whole other level. This was beyond fight or flight. This was kill or be killed. It was almost an out-of-body experience. 
The trespasser leapt towards me as I raised the gun to fire. Time seemed to stand still, and all my senses heightened to an uncomfortable degree. The crack of the discharge was deafening. The flash of the muzzle was blinding. The smell of the gunpowder was overpowering. Time moved so slowly, I felt like I could have taken a step and picked the speeding bullet right out of the air. A flower of blood exploded into bloom on the blank wall behind the masked assailant, and they were thrown backwards against the wall, leaving a nice big crater in the sheet rock. They dropped the knife and limply slumped down, leaving a streak of gore. And that was it. All of a sudden, it was silent, except for the jackhammering heartbeat thudding in my ears. I had shot them in the throat, directly through the Adam's apple, and if the way the body dropped was any indication, probably straight through the spine as well, severing the brain from the rest of the body. They glanced from the bloodied knife on the floor by their side, where it had come to rest, then to their motionless hand. They looked back to me, eyes burning with hate and shock through the holes of the balaclava. The eyes blinked quickly and settled on the thumb drive hanging around my neck. Their lips moved, mouthing something I couldn't make out. Maybe a last prayer for forgiveness. Maybe a curse against me. Any which way, I didn't care. And it didn't matter. With their spinal cord severed, the parasympathetic nervous system couldn't relay its electrical signals to the lungs to tell them to draw breath. I watched as the moving lips slowed and began to turn blue, and their eyes began to become unfocused and glazed over. I took the few steps across the room and yanked off the balaclava. It was the bodybuilder chick from the slaughterhouse, Zuzu. <laughs> Good riddance. One more freak dead. One less loose end. Three bodies now. A homicide hat trick. A murder turkey. If this were Call of Duty, I'd get a UAV. But this was real life, and all I'd be getting were nightmares, and possibly haunted by a trio of vengeful spirits. Good for me. At least I was still alive, I guess. I decided it was probably a good time to leave. Where there was one assassin, there would be more. And it was now pretty clear that the people after me wouldn't stop until I was dead. I gathered my few belongings quickly and made sure I still had both drives. The one with my new crypto wallet key and the one stolen from the director. I still didn't know what exactly was on it, and if Ashton's reaction to it was any indication, I didn't want to know, but I took it with me anyway. It could come in handy, call it insurance. I'd have to hide until I did the second exchange with my crypto contact. It seemed pretty obvious that that was how they had tracked me down when we had moved it all around the first time. If I could manage to stay alive long enough to convert the rest of it to cash, I could try to disappear and start my new life, leaving this town forever. I threw my stuff into the back seat of Ashton's car and drove off in search of a place to lay low. Thanks for listening. Thank you again to my friend Andrew Parker for this incredible series he has blessed us all with. Um, well, blessed is maybe not the term for it. How'd you like that, huh? A little, uh, or, uh, intestines hooked up to a recumbent bike or stationary bike. Is there a difference between the two? I don't know. There was part of me, I, I own a stationary bike that I bought during covid and part of me was very tempted to actually uh, put some meat in the spokes and try to get a sound that way. But then I thought, oh, that'd be such a mess. 
so I uh, just tried to get as creative as I could with the sound effects that wouldn't ruin um, my bike and my carpets. <laughs> for any of you who are new to the show, you can get this show ad-free on Patreon for only a dollar a month. And for $3 and up, you get bonus episodes. By the way, Patreon patrons, I have been talking about this uh, bonus episode creepypasta that I've been working on, and it's coming. I promise. It's just, um, I don't want to spoil which one it is, which creepypasta, but if you know what I'm talking about and you guess, then that's fine. But this one has to do with, um, different rooms you go into, and I've been taking it room by room and trying very hard to make it as binaural and immersive as possible. Of course I do that on the show here, but this particular story I chose because it really lends to some sounds that creep into your brain. So I've been trying really hard, I've been really trying to take my time with it, especially since it's a bonus episode, and so that will be coming out soon, but I have worked, I want to say three full work days on it already, and it's not done, so <laughs> don't worry, it's coming, but I have been definitely spending the hours on it. So I just wanted to throw that out there. You can also follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at scary to sleep. You can follow me personally on Twitter and Instagram at Shelby B. Scott. If you'd like, if you would like me to do what I just did to my friend Andrew's story to your story, send in your story to scary to sleep at gmail.com to be considered for the show. Oh, and it has been announced officially. If you don't follow me on social media, you might have seen it. Or if you, if you, that was wrong. If you do follow me, you might have seen it. If you don't, let me let you know that it is official. I will be at Midsummer Scream this July. So if you will be at Midsummer Scream, the convention in Long Beach, then please stop by and say hi. I'm going to be doing a panel with um, John Grills from Creepy, Pacific Obadiah from SCP Archives, and Trevor Henderson, who is the inventor, the creator of Siren Head. Yes, that Trevor Henderson. And I'm going to be doing a panel with them on internet urban legends. So please stop by and catch that because what a lineup, right? I feel like I'm the black sheep of all of them, but like, I, I feel like they're all just super cool. And I don't know, I'm, I'm very excited about it. And I might be doing a panel on my own. That's what I've been told anyway, but it wasn't on the official announcement. So I don't want to like say that for sure. And then stuff gets moved around. But apparently I'm also going to be doing a panel just by myself in the like podcast ASMR lounge, I think is what it's called. Uh, so check that out too. Please come. Oh my God, please come. Please don't let me be standing on a stage. <laughs> in a room by myself with no one there. That is my worst nightmare. Um, by the way, I did not sign myself up for this. Uh, so if you're, if you're sitting there like, well, then why'd you sign up for it, dummy? If you're so scared of it, I didn't, but my network, my amazing network, bloody FM has a lot of faith in me and has a lot of faith in you, the listener and knows you're going to show up and not make me look dumb and then I'll cry and you don't want me to cry do you I would cry a lot I would probably seriously just sit and cry and I don't know go eat my feelings somewhere in Long Beach <laughs> so yeah Midsummer Scream it's in July tickets are actually on sale until tonight at midnight um like 40 percent off some crazy percentage off so if you're listening today Friday the night the, the 28th the 19th where did I get the 19th Friday April 28th, then tickets are on sale until I think tonight at midnight. I want to say Pacific time, I assume, since that's where the convention is. 40% off. So that's pretty awesome. Come see me. Come see a lot of us. This year, Bloody Disgusting is going to be having a much bigger presence, and a lot of us are going to be there from the network. So yeah, come see us. It's going to be great. Here we've come to the ramble portion of the episode where I let us decompress from the episode and tell you about my week and what I baked this week and things like that. And I know some of you, this isn't your cup of tea, so I'm just letting you know. Time for you to turn off the episode and thanks for joining. And for the rest of you who enjoy this part, then let's get started, shall we? Last weekend, I went to the Renaissance Fair in Irwindale, the SoCal Renaissance Fair. I think it's the biggest in the country. It's definitely the biggest in the country. 
it might be the biggest in the world. I don't know for sure, but it's the biggest in the country, the Renaissance Pleasure Fair. It's so cool. It's going on until May 21st. So if you're anywhere near the area, I recommend, I highly recommend going. It's, uh, you walk in and the whole thing is really done up. Like it looks like a medieval village, like complete with dudes walking around with cabbages they're selling for a farthing. Like this is like, like LARPing cosplay Disneyland type shit on speed, but it's also like really <laughs> like body. Like, you know, it's just very like, there's a lot of cleavage. There's a lot of cleavage. It's amazing. And they'll like it, the, when you go order a beer, they'll flirt with you. It's so it's like, it's not, it, it is a fun place for the kids though. Like they don't, they keep adult stuff separate. They'll explain like, especially the shows, they'll say like, this is an adult show or whatever. Um, and there's nothing too overtly like sexual, but it, that's what I'm trying to say. It's a good place for everybody. And if you're an adult, you'll have a ton of fun. It's not like it is. I mean, it's cheesy, but it's not cheesy. Like it's pretty, a lot of the stuff is pretty accurate. They have these like vignettes set up everywhere where like the villagers are just existing. They're over here, you know, um, turning wool into yarn. And this guy's over here chopping onions with his cleaver. And this guy's over here making, um, uh, shawls. And this lady's over here being a blacksmith, making sword, like actually making swords in front of your face. We watched jousting. It was so cool. Oh my God. It was, it was just so much fun. It was a ton of fun. I highly recommend going. I highly recommend wearing sunscreen, please wear your sunscreen and drink your water. If you go, definitely it is out in the sun. There are a lot of shady spots and places to sit down, but it was just a very, it was a lot of sun, sun stuff, you know? So that was what I did last weekend. And that was a ton of fun. I, for baking this week, I baked a chocolate cake, basic chocolate cake. And I did a coffee milk soak. I took coffee extract that I have that I never know what to do with and mixed it with milk, did a coffee milk soak and then made a peanut butter frosting, but I did it with like also a like a hand whipped cream. So it was a little lighter than buttercream. And I used like less butter, more heavy cream, and it became like almost like mousse like. It, it's very, very good. Um, I didn't use a recipe, <laughs> sorry. I basically made American buttercream, but add heavy cream and vanilla and whatever peanut butter you have and there you go. There you have it. And like I said, the soak is just, I use coffee extract, but you could probably just use regular coffee. I just was like, oh my God, finally something. I had an idea of what to do with this fucking coffee extract I got that I have a huge bottle of and I don't know what to do with. Uh, I got it as a gift and I just haven't figured out, I don't know, most coffee recipes will ask for actual coffee. So it's just been, it was still sealed too. So I was happy to find something to do with it, but it was fantastic. The whole thing all those flavors blended together so beautifully. Oh my God. I highly recommend if you're looking for some flavors to try out this weekend, if you're baking chocolate cake, coffee, milk, soak, peanut butter frosting, ugh, to die for seriously. Oh, a couple things I forgot to mention before I go, um, new episode of historic hangouts is out. And I thought it was one of our funniest. At least we had fun. We died laughing. It was, it was amazing. Um, so new episode of historic hangouts is out now. And with the announcement of me being at Midsummer Scream, they put out a little, they put a picture of me with the little Midsummer Scream border. It was very cute. I put it on Instagram. I put it everywhere, but cats out of the bag because I didn't realize they were going to use that in the little Chiron. Um, I am the director of the upcoming show Skin Crawl that is going to be coming out on the network. So if you see that on the, uh, the little thing and you're like, what is Skin Crawl? It's a new podcast coming out that I am directing, and I don't, I, I don't think I can give you a lot of details right now. But that is one of my secret projects I've been working on. It's really cool. It has to do with really cool people, like actual celebrities. I got to direct actual celebrities, you guys. Uh, very exciting project. Cannot wait for that to come out. It's going to be coming out a little like around July, so perfect timing for Midsummer Scream. So. I get to say that I'm a director now out loud and it feels really good. I've worked <laughs> really, really hard and I, this is a, such a cool place to be in and it's been such a great opportunity. Seriously, it's been amazing and I'm so glad that this amazing network has had faith in me to direct this very important, very cool project and I hope you all like it a lot. Okay, I've been rambling for way too long. I'm going to go. Remember, drink your water, wear your sunscreen. 
go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.